guys, thank you very much. Away we go on game number six on a 71 degree night in Cleveland, Ohio. And here we are. It's the World Series with Cleveland up three games to two. And now welcome to the broadcast booth everybody I'm Joe Buck the Hall of Famer John Smoltz is coming right up. OK World Series and Game Six that combination has provided some of the greatest thrills in the history of this game. You think about Carlton Fisk in 1975 you think about the Mets comeback at home in 1986 you think about David Freeze and the home run he hit in 2011 against the Texas Rangers. Can't wait to see what's in store for us tonight in Cleveland Ohio and John Smoltz I know you're excited to get this thing underway. What are you looking for tonight. Well there's so much emotion right the determination to get this done. Maybe we can simplify it and say the number five is going to have a play in this series and that's the five that I'm talking about the Cubs lineup the top five they're going to have to produce. They're the only ones that have been producing look at the numbers they're going to have to get it done. What Joe Madden did by putting Kyle Schwarber in the second spot is a game changer. He will get pitched to instead of in game earlier in the series they don't have to pitch to him if he's in the fifth spot so I think the number five is essential for both ball clubs and how about this as the series returns to the American League City you get the advantage for the National League team with the DH back the Cubs get their DH back in Kyle Schwarber OK the number five applied to the Cleveland side as well. They're undefeated when leading after five their last twenty three games it is so important to get to the fifth inning with the lead. Terry Francona has so many decisions to make but the one he can go to is Andrew Miller and when does he go to him. So if you're Josh Tomlin you got to be able to give him the ball with the lead or tied and then the Indians are in a good spot. It's Josh Tomlin against Jake Arrieta it is game number six tonight and in a series that is so evenly matched talent wise sometimes it's the strategy that makes all the difference. The objective is simple get the path to victory complex strategy put to the test maneuvers contested each move setting up the next until one is victorious Chicago refused to be a pawn in game five definitely moving around the board to avoid elimination with their pieces set Cleveland looks to capture a World Series title for the first time since 1948. The Cubs hope to avoid checkmate while the Indians look to be crowned king. Who will make the right moves tonight?
71 degrees. And the average temperature, you see where it typically is, on average, 23 degrees cooler. And the wind is blowing out to center. The matchup, Tomlin and Arietta, the matchup. Rosenthal against Verducci, and it's Ken Rosenthal who gets to go first. Joe, for all the news at the top of the Cubs lineup, there is some intrigue at the bottom as well. Joe Madden talked at length with Javier Baez today about letting the ball travel deeper, creating more time for himself at the plate. The two continued their work and conversations during batting practice, and Baez hit one ball after another to the opposite field. If we see that tonight, it will be a great sign for Baez and for the Cubs. Now over to Tom Fiducci. Well, the Cleveland Indians really believe in metrics that show when the lineup turns over a third time, relief pitchers are more effective than starting pitchers. Terry Comp Francona is very comfortable putting the game in the hands of Andrew Miller, Brian Shaw, and Cody Allen. Sounds like a law firm. Miller, Shaw, and Allen. Well, they've allowed only one earned run in 13 innings and struck out 43% of the batters they faced. So if the Cubs do not have an early lead, their task is a difficult one. They will have to beat Cleveland's best public defenders. Joe? Yeah, and really, if you think about where Francona has been, John Smoltz, he's in essence trying to get through this World Series in the bulk of the postseason with six guys, three starters and the three main contributors out of the bullpen that Tom just talked about. But here's Tomlin on short rest. He's 2 and 0 this postseason. He makes his fourth start. His ERA is 1 and 3 quarters. I, I will be interested to see how he gets along. I, I know we talk about his confidence, but here he is facing the Cubs with three days of rest. So they just saw him back in Chicago. To me, it's different than Corey Kluber. Kluber's got the ability to change his game plan. We'll see how Josh Tomlin does after uh, after that game three start. Yeah, absolutely. The less pitches he throws per at bat, the better. Because when it get deeper, he's not the wipeout strikeout guy that we saw Kluber. Give me the Cubs lineup, and it's much different tonight because of the DH spot. Dexter Fowler leads it off, then it's Kyle Schwarber, then it's Chris Bryant, who's back in the number three spot for the first time since the 3rd of July. That Bryant's been third and Rizzo's been fourth for the Cubs. Selbrist, Addison Russell, Wilson Contreras, Jason Hayward, and Javi Baez. For Tomlin, he's going to have to paint the corners, throw his curveball for effect, and his cutters in on left handers. Strike two. Take you around the rest of the defense for Cleveland. Coco Crisp is back in the outfield. He's in left. Tyler Naquin in center, and Lonnie Chisenhall, who's been battling the flu, is in right. Here's Jose Ramirez, Francisco Lindor, Jason Kipnis, and Mike Napoli on the infield. Third to first, and Roberto Perez does the catching. As Kyle Schwarber, the DH, protected by Bryant behind him, digs in. Lamb to pull everywhere. And he does. To the right side. Kipnis. Two out. Well, just like I said, if it's going to be good for the Indians, it's going to be quick results for Tomlin. And I would think that the Cubs are going to be aggressive. It's a good hitting and good pitching environment, unlike the last time they were here. And for the Cubs, they would love nothing more than to elevate and get some gaps and possibly some home runs. But right now Tomlin has such confidence. He's on such a roll since September. He feels like he's unbeatable. 
Chris Bryant two hits in this World Series but one of them huge leading off the fourth inning of game five he tied it with a home run into left center at Wrigley two nights ago. Strike one. For coverage of this game in Spanish please tune to Fox Deportes. He looks like a jugs gun here early, just firing strikes. That's what he does, and that's what he's been doing. Fearless. High fly ball in the air to left. Cubs strike first. Tape measure shot by Chris Bryant. You cannot throw him a curveball for a strike, especially with two strikes. The way that his swing through the zone, he has that unbelievable lift. And they have been a steady diet of breaking balls. And finally, Bryant says, you know what? I'm going to sit on one. And sit on one did he. And that was a no-doubter. Now Rizzo so Bryant hitting in the number three spot for the first time since the first days of July as his second home run in as many games and now Rizzo trying to follow suit back to the homer who went slider curveball curveball but see that loop right there and see that swing path that is exactly what has made this guy the MVP this year and everybody in the playoffs has pitched him tough and he hasn't been unleashed via the home run till lately. It took Tomlin nine pitches to have a three up three down first inning in game three that game by the way ending in a one to nothing Cleveland win here's pitch 11 with the Cubs on top Rizzo that's into right center for a hit and the top of the first inning continues. Yeah, hanging change up, and we said the front five guys, right? The first five guys of this lineup for the Cubs have to do the damage. So far, two outs, Homer, right there's the pitch, and he knows it right away. So does Tomlin, and then Rizzo hits a hanging change up and doesn't try to do too much with it, gets a base hit. Zobris, the ultimate protector, batting fifth. And here he is, just three for 21 in his career against Tomlin. Rizzo hadn't even taken his lead yet. Josh Tomlin allowed 36 home runs during the regular season. The second most in the American League had allowed none this postseason until Bryant got him in the first. Still in the first. Zobris. Strike one. Well, he's definitely throwing strikes and he's attacking the zone. Fortunately for the Indians, Tomlin's home runs he's given up. They haven't been many, to your point, have all been solos. Same for the Indians now. They've allowed eight solo shots as a pitching staff this postseason. The 0 1 to Zobrist. That's in the right center, a base hit. Rizzo will turn and go. First and third with two out here in the first. Now the interesting thing here for Tomlin is you've got to be mentally tough here because your curveball is a weapon and the guys you're going to face next you need it. Russell struggles with curveballs but the last couple the left handers have been able to stay back see it well and Zobris who's been hot finds the gap playing deep keeps the runner from scoring. You see Schwarber likes what he sees now Russell been moved up struggling with off speed pitch. To see if he can stay with the theme of going the other way, get away from trying to pull the ball, and stay on the breaking ball. The 22 year old shortstop fouls it back. 
hardest thing in pitching is when you feel like that you set up a lineup you faced them twice your curveball is very effective you just can't eliminate it you just got to execute better. This is just the second career start on three days rest for Tomlin. It's just the second time in this World Series as we play here in game six. The Cubs have had three straight hits. It started with a homer. And then crisp singles into right center by the lefties Rizzo and Zilbrist. Center, Nate went to his left. Chisholm home, neither one gets it. One run scores. Here comes Zobrist. Throw home. Safe as the ball gets away, and Russell ends up at third. And a big misplay out in right center. It's 3 0. You can see this right from the beginning. Watch Naquin. He's the captain. He's got to make the call. And he looks over to his teammate. And once he did that, neither one was in position to catch the ball. And then Zobris taking no chances. You can see right there, Chisholm's like, what are you doing? And then the catcher is absolutely fair game when he puts himself in the way of the plate. The throw took him that place. Half slide, half barrel. And two outs, nobody on. And the next thing you know, it's three to nothing, Cubs. Wow. Only because nobody touched it does it go down as a two run double for Addison Russell. Then the error on the second baseman, Kipnis, on the throw. Either could have caught it easily. And neither Chisholm Hall nor Naquin went for it. And I think what Chisholm Hall did is kind of threw a deke indirectly to Naquin. When he goes in front of him and the ball's going to go over his head, Naquin thinks he's thinks that he's got it. And so he gives up on it. Wow, what a tough break for the Indians. Now runner at third is Russell for Wilson Contreras. So those are three earned runs because the error came on the throw home which allowed Russell to move from second to third. And again it's charged to Kipnis his third error of this World Series. Contreras likes to take a strike. He's already done that. Here's the 0 1. And already action for Cleveland in their bullpen. It's Mike Clevenger, the hard throwing right hander who pitched in game five. Here comes a 1 1. Down and away ball two. Two outs in game one, Lester. And then the Indians scored two runs, went on to win that game. Two outs, nobody on here. A homer, couple hits, a misplayed ball, and a little less enthusiastic crowd. Even though it's in the first inning, they know they still have a lot of time left. Here's a 2-1 to Contreras. 2-2. Two two. Both Contreras and Baez, as this series has played out, have been more and more aggressive with one strike in the count. Not a not to mention two strikes really expanding the zone. Crowd trying to rally behind Tomlin. That's outside for a full count. And the hard part here on a 3-2 count for Tomlin is 
you cannot give in. Do not give in to this count because you've got to bet on Contreras wants to do more and will not take the walk so you can go to your off speed pitch if you want. Another chance in right center and Naquin says I've got it and this time he handles it but the Cubs down three games to two come up with three in the first Bryant started it with a home run and the Cubs have come out swinging in game six after a half lead three nothing. Wiser, this bud's for you. And by Chevrolet, more 2016 JD Power Dependability Awards than any other brand. Game six into the bottom of the first inning. Cleveland coming to bat. What do they have in store for Jake Arrieta? Top three, the DH, Carlos Santana, then Jason Kipnis, then Francisco Lindor. In the middle, it's Mike Napoli, Jose Ramirez, and Lonnie Chisenhall. And on the back end, it's Coco Crisp in left, Tyler Naquin in center, and Roberto Perez catching and batting ninth. Against Jake Arrieta, the reigning Cy Young Award winner after his 22 and 6 season a year ago. He backed it up with 18 wins this year. One and one this postseason, the winner game two. And that misses inside ball one to Carlos Santana. Uh, the patience of the Indians, even though they gave up three in the first, work the count against Jake. See if he's on with his fastball. A ball and a strike. In the first game they faced, by my count, they had taken 44 of his fastballs. 44. And the key for Jake Arrieta, if he's got his cutter, it's going to be a good game. He's been struggling. The weather's going to help his cutter, but he can lose it for four to six to seven pitches with that fastball command. Rarely does he go to his four seamer. He likes the two seamer. You saw the curveball there. But the cutter's the key, and the Indians' patience if he gets wild. On a 71 degree night, one two pitch. Struck him out, and a good start for Arrieta. In the outfield is Ben Zilbrist already in the middle of the action offensively Dexter Fowler in center and Jason Hayward in right around the infield is Bryant Russell Baez and Rizzo Wilson Contreras does the catching the 24 year old rookie and he'll flash the signs to Arietta with Jason Kipnis at the plate 97 you don't think those three runs did something for him stepping out there in the bottom of the first 
95 foul back. Great luxury. The Indians in the first 13 postseason games in the first inning alone only give up three runs. Tonight, they match that total. Not what they were looking for in the start. Misplay a big part of it in right center. The 0 1. Look at this. In the regular season, the Cubs scored six or more runs in 15 of his 18 wins. There's certain guys, the number just comes up and they get runs. Arietta got runs in the first inning tonight. Well, I'd say it's not his lucky t shirt because he doesn't wear a t shirt. Maybe it's undergarments or something, but you <laughs> got to believe he's got something really? that works. Oh, man, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Here's a one two pitch. Kipnis. To the right side, Baez with a backhand and a flip. The routine is fun to watch with Baez, two out. And there was a cutter right there. Not his best, but because you have to, as a hitter, be prepared for so much movement. You've got the lateral movement away. You see the cutter right there. It's supposed to be in more. But he threw 20 cutters in the previous game, and none of which resulted in a hit. So the cutter is such a big weapon because it's equalizer to this two seam moving away from left handers and that's what the Indians are trying to kind of hoping he doesn't have tonight. But the base is empty. Here's Francisco Lindor. Strike one from Arietta, who lasted five and two thirds in game two allowed a run on just two hits. Struck out six walked three. His one loss this postseason came in L.A. There's another strike. And it's 0-2. Well, he looks smooth. And I'm telling you, sometimes the three runs can make you nervous because you don't ever anticipate it in a World Series game, an eliminating game. But it doesn't look like the three runs did anything but fire him up. And the reason I say makes you nervous, as a pitcher, you don't prepare for a lead. You prepare to pitch a tight game. Don't give up any runs. Nose to the ground. Don't pay attention to anything else. You look up three nothing. You're like, whoa. Now it's mine. Does not get the call on that tailing pitch. He started to walk away, and Joe West, the veteran umpire, says, "Stay on the mound." Well, that's a great pitch and a great reaction by Arietta. You don't do anything. Joe West, one of the veteran guys. Do not show your displeasure, and it'll be an okay game. Are you saying that Joe West can get a little ticked off if you show him up? Oh boy. Kenny, the famous bum garner and Joe West stare off. Uh, Joe's been in the game for at least 30 plus years and certainly won't take kindly to questioning 60 feet away from him. Two two. Full count. On deck, Napoli. Two out walk. From a near strikeout, Arietta thought he had to a two out walk to keep the inning alive for Napoli. And this will this will frustrate not only the pitching coach but Joe Madden. He did this a couple times. He had 0-2 six times in the first game, and he can make an 0-2 to 3-2 scenario pretty quick. And that's that's something you can't do in these moments. You work extra hard to do things that you had the hitter right where you wanted him in 0-2. Again, two outs. You've got to get three outs. We've seen what can happen in an innocent walk, then a stolen base, and then possibly a hit. The homer for Napoli this postseason came in Toronto during the ALCS. When he connects, they fly. Strike one. And just because it's 3 nothing, the Indians cannot deviate from running. They must run. You can run on Jake. You can run on Lester. When you get on, you have to make it you have to make it difficult for the Cubs. I say he's got to go right here.
Interestingly, Lindor has tried to run four times. He's been successful only once. And he's one for three specifically in this World Series. And it might be just a little bit of nerves, but Jake is slow to the plate. Yes, he can pick up at first, unlike Lester. To right there. But you have to be disciplined to say, as soon as I see movement, I got to go because I'm gauging that my lead and jump is going to be better than the combo of Jake and Contreras getting the ball to second. That's fouled back and out of play, strike two. Cubs fell down in this series three games to one. The last team in a World Series to come back and win down three games to one in a World Series. The 85 Royals, but they had the final two games at home. Cubs trying to do it on the road. Here's a one two. So far, that's an extra, what, eight or nine pitches after being 0-2. They add up. Pitch number 20 is out number three. And Arietta bookends the first inning with strikeouts. Indians leave a man, and after one in game six, 3-0, Chicago.
Chevrolet, the official vehicle of Major League Baseball. Chevrolet has earned more 2016 JD Power Dependability Awards than any other brand as Hayward skies one into right and Chisenhall will drift back to get it. One pitch, one out in the second. You can learn more about Chevrolet at Chevrolet.com. Well, you can see the approach by the Cubs has been pretty simple. See something you like, go after it. Other than Fowler, who typically likes to see a few pitches out of the leadoff spot, it's been in a more aggressive approach and a better feeling for the Cubs. They are by far a very contagious hitting team, one way or the other. When they're hitting, they're hitting a lot. When they're not, we've seen how they've been shut down. Problem for Chicago has been hitting with runners on base in the World Series prior to the first inning were 12 for 77. Here's Baez takes a strike. That's a 156 average tonight two for three in the first inning. Well here's Baez. You heard from Ken Rosenthal before the game about the meetings that Madden has had with Baez. There's another strike in its own two. Trying to make him cut down trying to pull everything murder every pitch and he swung at 58 percent the pitches out of the strike zone that's a pitch that's been getting them ball one yeah and you could just tell I mean a concerted effort it helps they got a three run lead one at bat can change the at bats in the eyes of the pitcher if they see a less aggressive bias a more disciplined if possible bias. That's up the middle. Tough play. Kipnis throws across his body. Got it. And the first base coach, Brandon Hyde, immediately says, look at that to his dugout. And we'll see if the Cubs want to challenge it. And we'll get another peek at it. These plays are always difficult for the first base umpire. You're listening for sound from the glove and the foot hitting the bag and he might have gotten that uh, right in the live action. Well you get an extra challenge in the postseason but they're not going to look at it. What a play by Kipnis. Yeah, great play. The accuracy of the throw was going to be so important. Bias can run. Well, the more you see Jason Kipnis, and I know he hasn't been hitting the way he would have liked coming into this postseason, but the more you like him, he's a gritty player. Hit a big three run home run in game four at Wrigley. Emotional heart and soul of this team with two out, nobody on. Fowler, ball one. Good at bat, though. When we were talking to Joe Madden, he wanted the ball to get deeper. And when, he, when a hitter wants the ball to get deeper, he doesn't care if he gets jammed. It sounded like he broke his bat on that ball, staying up the middle. So that worked. That was a positive at bat, even though it resulted in an out. When you're not letting the ball get deep, you're jumpy and you're expanding, you're moving your head, your body, and that's why you swing at pitches that are so far out of the zone. Fowler skies one into right. Chisenhall near the line. Tomlin comes back with a one, two, three second bottom half. Three nothing Cubs.
Tonight's telecast is sponsored by Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Official caps, t-shirts, hoodies, jerseys, jackets, and more. Get all your Cubs and Indians World Series gear and celebrate your favorite team at MLBShop.com. Bottom of the second, here's Jose Ramirez. Strike one from Arietta. Two out walk by Arietta to Lindor in the first inning. Struck out two, including Napoli to end the first. That's a strike, and it's nothing in two. Now that curveball's such a weapon. He gets a lot of called strikes with it. He'll get more action pitches, meaning swings and outs with his cutter, swings and misses with his curveball. Struck him out as Ramirez chased it up and away. One down. Well, we've been saying it all postseason, certainly during this World Series, the last time the Cleveland Indians won it all, 1948. That great team, the last World Series championship, 24,858 days ago. There's Eddie Robinson then, first baseman on that club. Here is Eddie Robinson now, the last surviving member of that Indians 48 championship team, 95 years old. And looks fantastic. At the ballpark tonight. There's a strike to Chisholm Hall. When announcers used to show up in Cleveland, didn't matter the sport. They'd say, well, this city's been dying for a championship since 1964. The Cleveland Browns won the NFL championship. That's a foul ball over the Baltimore Colts. They waited 52 years until this past June, and the Cavs won it all, coming back from down three games to one to beat Golden State. And now, four and a half months later, Indians trying to get their championship. They came so close in 97, and they blew a ninth inning lead in game seven and lost to the Marlins in extra innings. Ball one to Chisholm Hall. And so far, Arietta 0 and 2 or 1 and 2 against every hitter. A good start, aggressive start. He's commanding his pitches. And he looks like the Arietta of last year. <laughs> Throwing hard tonight. Four strikeouts through an inning and two thirds. Know, talking to him about the environment and the weather in his previous game as you see this electric fastball he said the weather and the grip had a lot to do with kind of his lack of command or the feeling of grip pressure so much different tonight this is normal feeling to a pitcher and to a hitter the two out nobody on Coco crisp digs his way in. Ball one. Talking about Eddie Robinson, a couple final notes. Longtime baseball scout and executive GM of the Braves and Rangers. At 95, he's the 11th oldest former player. There's a good tight breaking ball from Arietta. How about this? When Babe Ruth was at Yankee Stadium in June of 1948, the Cleveland Indians were there. And Ruth gave that farewell speech. He would die two months later in August. And it was Eddie Robinson's bat that Babe Ruth used to lean on to make that speech as the Yankees retired his number that day. That's cool. Boy, does he look good. Here comes a 2-1 to Coco Crisp. Left side, Brian waits on it. Arietta, good start. Two scoreless third inning rolls in. Game six comes batting. Heart of the order coming up. They lead it by three.
We'll give you World Series Game 5. Fourth inning, down by one. And Chris Bryant found the bleachers in left center tonight. StatCast, powered by Amazon Web Services. This blast put the Cubs up one to nothing in the first inning. It was followed by a si single by Rizzo, a single by Zilbrist, and a two-run double in quotes. On a ball hit by Addison Russell that dropped in right center. Both Chisenhall and Naquin could have caught, but neither one did. And looking at each other, two runs crossed to home plate. 2-0 now on Schwarber. Kyle had only one at bat during the three games that were played at Wrigley. And he has shown patience at the plate he did in the first two games of this World Series. For the evolution of Kyle Schwarber, could he possibly? Yes, he's going to play. Could he get a hit? Yes. Now it's almost as if he's Babe Ruth in this lineup. Good pitch from Tomlin. Who's trying to survive and get through this third inning after there was action behind him in the Cleveland bullpen in the first? Well, that's where you got to tie him up. You got to tie up Schwarber, throw it up above his hands. Don't make a mistake, though. That was Josh Tomlin's dad, Jerry, who was flown in here. And it was a person who just wanted to help out. Three two. That's foul. And as we talked about a circulatory issue. In the spine for Jerry Tomlin. During the month of August that's when. He was hit with that he has been paralyzed. From the waist down. Somebody offered to fly the parents of Josh Tomlin in on a private plane. And so Tomlin gets to have his parents here after they were at Wrigley and he pitched brilliantly in game three. Yeah, and he really only should have given up one run here because you talk about that misplay, the homer to Bryant, the only run. 3 2. That's a leadoff walk on a borderline pitch. But here's what, why everyone's talking about Schwarber. And even though he hasn't played but a few games, the Cubs lineup is exposed in this postseason. They had too many swing and miss outs. Putting him in the second spot makes it tougher on a pitcher to go through the top five that we were talking about in the open. Three runs of the top five hitters scored in the first inning. He lengthens the lineup, and what that means is you now have to face the meat of the order with potential runners on because the back end of the Cubs lineup has not produced. Here's Bryant who homered his first time and he gets this off the end of the bat. He's getting better swings. Long run and in that Bermuda Triangle again. It's Chisenhall. As Naquin has to hit the deck. Kipnis was going way out. And Naquin I think is getting a little frustrated out there in right center. Chisenhall stepped forward and made that grab one out. Yeah you don't see this too often. All right. You know that the infielder is going to give way. But somebody has got to either be louder because this is the second time this could have been a big issue on a routine fly ball. Naquin of course plays against right handers. And that one almost another issue. Well Naquin got up and was complaining to Kipnis I think. Showing his frustration as Chisenhall didn't back away. As you said, the first time it happened, that's the center fielder's job to take charge out there. Here's Rizzo. Strike one from Tomlin with Otero up for Cleveland in their bullpen. I thought this would be the hardest game in the world to Terry Francona to manage. Now, 3 nothing changes it, but the reason I thought it was going to be a hard game is you have one game to play with, but he doesn't want to play with it. He's going to have to manage the bullpen in a strange way tonight. That's popped behind the plate. We'll get out of play. Strike two. And what I mean by that is typically you ask your starter to give you six, seven. Well, that's not what he's asking Tomlin. And if the game would have been close or does get close in the fifth, it's pretty much going to be Miller and the rest of the boys. But you've got to access Miller in a 
in a winning environment because you can't burn him and not win the game because you have a game seven tomorrow to play if you don't win tonight. Tom Verducci, what do you see from Tomlin down there? Yeah, that was a rare curveball right there from Tomlin. This is a guy in the postseason elevated his curveball usage from 15% to 35%. But in that first inning, you saw the hanging curve to Bryant, the hanging curve to Zobras. Since the Zobras tip, that's just the second curveball that Tomlin has thrown. And you see these Cub hitters, once you eliminate a pitch from a pitcher, hitting gets a little bit easier. One on, one out. Line drive to the end of the Chicago dugout. Still one and two. Well, and this will do your brain as a pitcher. You just sometimes will tuck this in your back pocket after a couple of these. You've just got to find it an at bat that you can get locked back in on the location of that pitch and still trust you can throw it because you're going to need it for some of these hitters. Any more trouble? He may be out of the game. One ball, two strikes, trying to get Rizzo. Two and two. Curveball on the outside part. It's not taking that left turn. It's not going down as much. He spins it at a high rate. And when it's good, it starts at the belt and drops it to shin guards. Rizzo with another base hit, two for two. And Schwarber will end up at second. We'll see if Francona is going to go any deeper into the game. With Josh Tomlin on the mound. Otero's getting loose. And here's another one. Another breaking ball, curve ball that Rizzo just smokes back up the middle. Rizzo stays inside of the ball, which means he goes up the middle and doesn't try to pull it. You sometimes got to tip your hat to a hitter. If you make a pitch that's on the outer half, maybe a little bit too high. But Rizzo starting to see the ball really good. The timing of hitting for the Cubs couldn't come at a better time. Down three games to one, trying to force this to a game seven. Zobrist had six total hits across the first two series of the postseason. Much better in this World Series. He's got eight, eight for 20. Singled score to run in the first. Ball one. The inside part of the plate where Joe West is setting up has been very strict. He has not given an inch on that side of the plate. The outside part of the plate where he is not set up is more leniency over it. You see he's setting up over the right shoulder of the catcher and he'll stay there. This time Tomlin gets the call, a ball and a strike. I, I always, when I was pitching, wanted to know where the lenient side of the plate, where can I get the extra inch? And typically you find that out really quickly, sometimes based on where the umpire is actually setting up. Because he's got a better view right there. Just that's a great shot by our camera to see he's locked in on that side. The outside's a little bit more of a guess. Hard hit but foul. Strike two. It was a year ago tonight. Ben Zobrist and the Kansas City Royals celebrated a world championship with a win at City Field over the Mets. Now trying to help the Cubs get to tomorrow night. Schwarber will be held and the bases are loaded with one out as Rizzo and Zobrist have gone four for four and that's the only issue with Schwarber you got to take the one base at a time because of his knee and that's going to be it more than likely for Tom Gary Jones the third base coach wisely holding Schwarber at third. The bases are loaded. Tomlin is gone. Otero's coming in. 
opportunity for Chicago as they already lead by three here in the third. AT&T call to the bullpen earlier than Terry Francona wanted. It's Dan Otero. His work in five games this postseason. Bases loaded, one out. Russell takes a ball. The Cubs tonight, four for six with runners on. Again, after going 12 for 77 with men on through the first five games. I think this is a decent matchup for Russell. Otero likes to pitch right-handers in. Russell of course struggles with the ball away and breaking balls drove in 95 runs during the regular season takes it down the count to an 0. so now you just look at one spot and one spot only this is where you think about lift get the ball in the air if nothing else a sack fly look in the gaps remember the lead runner is Kyle Schwarber coming off in season knee surgery on his left knee. 2-0. High fly ball to left center at the wall. Grand slam. 7-0 Chicago. Addison Russell came into this game over his last eight, hitting over 300. Two huge home runs in the NLCS out in Los Angeles. And now a crushing grand slam here in the third inning to open it up. Up by seven. Still only one out. And a strike to Wilson Contreras. Yeah, it just didn't look like a good matchup on paper. Russell likes the ball middle in, and he got behind 2 0, and he stayed there and look, just looked to lift it. Lift it, he did. And a most memorable grand slam that not only he and his teammates will never forget. 
There you go. Canerco, the last to hit a grand slam in a World Series game, game two of 05, for the White Sox against Houston, in the 19th in World Series history. Two hops to Lindor to his left. Two out. Well, he's in a box here with 2 0, and you see the sinker catches the middle, middle, and that's all you got to look for as a hitter. Even though the bases were loaded and it's a 2 0 count, you can never give in to the hitter. I'm sure he was trying to paint that a little bit, and he didn't. And all of Chicago heard this. Now Hayward takes a strike. Say it again. Two huge home runs out in L.A. With his Cubs down two games to one. In the NLCS. Game four, game five. And now this shot. To alleviate some, not all, of the pressure here in game six. As the count goes to one and one on Hayward. Well, unfortunately for Francona, this game got easier to manage now. At a seven nothing deficit his team's gonna have to crawl back but it affects the way he uses his pen and he'll have a loaded pen ready barring a big comeback by the Indians for tomorrow it's easy to forget how young Addison Russell is because we've heard about him in the minor leagues with Oakland and the trade to the Chicago Cubs he's just 22 years old and during the regular season Drove home 95 runs hit 21 home runs. The ball really jumps off his bat and that's his third home run of this postseason. Yeah and it does and the low, the low average speaks to what we've seen in the postseason. Anybody with stuff but spinning away from him he really struggled that leg kick got higher. But when he can stay inside the ball and that's a theme with these Cubs hitters young hitters. Hayward pops it up. Out goes Lindor. Inning over. Good things happen. In the inning, Tomlin is chased. Russell chased one out of the park, a grand slam in the third inning. It's seven to nothing as they celebrate at Murphy's Bleachers in Chicago as the Cubs try to force a game seven.
Ball one to Tyler Naquin. And we're underway in the bottom of the third inning, seven to nothing. Chicago on top. The Indians will try to chip away. That's ball two, two and oh. And that's exactly what the Indians are going to have to do. Grind out at bats. Find ways to get on base. Still stay aggressive. And climb back in this game. A lot of time. Two and one. Hey. Naquin then Perez then back to the top of the order Santana. Only base runner against Arietta the two out walk to Lindor in the first. Two and two. Naquin came up and provided some big mo moments for the Indians but when the word gets out that they can power you with fastballs he has yet to make that adjustment against the league. Got him looking at 95. There's a fastball and strikeout number five. And the number nine hitter Roberto Perez will step in. Sunday night in Chicago, 1987 NL MVP Andre Dawson accompanied Freddie Morales from Union League Boys and Girls Club in Chicago to the mound. And earlier tonight, Rosetta Shepard, a member of the Boys and Girls Clubs in Lorain County. Delivered the game ball with Len Barker, who once threw a perfect game for Cleveland each year. MLB and Boys and Girls Clubs work together to create unique opportunities for nearly 4 million children and teens worldwide. To find out how you can help, go to greatfutures.org. Strike one on Roberto Perez. Three for 16 in this World Series. Two of his three hits left the yard, and they both came in game one. One ball, one strike. Well, the Indians did a good job the first two games in Chicago, kind of taking the crowd out of the home park. And certainly, that's been the case here tonight in the first inning and now in the third. One one pitch. Fly ball to center right at Dexter Fowler. Two down. And back to the top of the order, it's Carlos Santana. A lot of people outside. Gateway Plaza after the Cavs won 128 to 120 over the Rockets. So they're happy about their Cavs, the NBA champions, not happy about what they see tonight inside Progressive Field. But Cleveland leads three games to two. Santana backs out. It's amazing how people think. You just talk to people in the city and they say, oh, I'm worried about karma. You know, the, the Cavaliers came back from three games to one. Maybe we used up all our karma if we don't win tonight. It's like all these storylines change in, in such a quick moment, but the fact is, the American League, because the All Star game has game seven, the home field advantage. We'll see how it plays out if need be a game seven, but. All that karma stuff, I don't know about that. And even crossing karma over from one sport to the other. Yeah, well, the same city, that's what they're worried about. Yeah. They used it all up, is what <laughs> some of the fans have thought. One and one the count with two out, nobody on. Santana struck out his first time. Arietta pitching with a seven run cushion and a ground ball to Rizzo. The flip, the out, and Arietta's in charge, and so are the Cubs in game six, seven to nothing, Chicago after three.
930 Eastern FS1. As we welcome you back to the fourth inning of Game 6, the Cubs lead 7 to nothing. Tonight's aerial coverage brought to you by DirecTV. If you call yourself a sports fan, you got to get DirecTV. Call 1-800-DIRECTV. It will be Javier Baez to lead it off, then Dexter Fowler, then Kyle Schwarber, the DH, against Danny Salazar. And Salazar misses with a 95-mile-an-hour fastball that rides up and in. Salazar went down in September. It was a foul back by Baez. Within nine days, the Cleveland Indians lost the number two and three starters, Danny Salazar and then Carlos Carrasco. Lost Carrasco to a broken hand. Salazar had a forearm strain that he's worked his way back from. And here he is added to the active roster for this World Series. No swing there in the count two and one. And you think about how Terry Francona has guided this team to this point. Their best player, Michael Brantley, was third in the MVP voting back in 2014. Played only 11 games out with a shoulder issue. There's a strike. Two and two. And yet here they are. All those injuries. And they're one win away from winning everything. Yeah, it really has been historic. I don't think people can throw that name around too loosely. But when you beat the likes of the teams they did in the quick fashion they did. A strikeout of Baez starts the fourth. I think the Indians have just as good a chance next year to get back. It's because of that starting pitching that they have. And if they stay healthy, they can use these weapons and ride another division title. They just weren't as good as advertised until their injuries. And then Terry Francona really had no choice but to use the limited weapons he had and use them as much as possible. With one out, nobody on, the batter is Fowler. Ball one to Dexter, who is 0 for 2. Strike one. In a division that they ended up running away with, with the great hitting of the Detroit Tigers and the world champs, Kansas City. They used that right handed pitching and dominated. Salazar's got a great on. Carrasco, of course, we already seen Kluber and may see him tomorrow night as well. But that's, on Fowler. that's the mixed view that people are getting confused on. The, Can the, the, the Kansas City model is a great one, it's turned into the Cleveland Indians model. But only because they lost some starters. That, they didn't do that all year. They rode their starters for the most part. Full count on Fowler. And that's what the Chicago Cubs did. That's why the Cubs are going to be in the same spot next year. They've got their, their starters returning, their young players, the Indians. Whoever loses this series is still going to be in great shape moving forward. Strikeout from Salazar, back to back, two out. Tonight's telecast is sponsored by AT&T. And by Walmart, save money, live better. Schwarber now with the bases empty, two down. Kyle drew a leadoff walk in the third inning on a borderline 3 2 pitch. Bryant fly to right, but then hits by Rizzo and Zilbris loaded him up. Pitching change. And Addison Russell went deep for a grand slam to make it 7 0 against Dan Otero. Statcast is powered by Amazon Web Services, and to say they're playing him to pull. An understatement, especially on the infield. Steady goes the other way. Into left. Crisp is back. And a good inning for Salazar. Bottom of the fourth here in game six. Cubs are celebrating so far tonight. Not so for Cleveland. Down seven.
As we welcome you back to the bottom of the fourth inning, Cleveland trying to string some hits together. It's Kipnis. And it's a ball from Jake Arietta. Kipnis, Lindor, and Napoli. Anybody gets on Jose Ramirez. Here's a 1 0 from Arietta. Check swing on ball two. Like we talked about a number of times back in Chicago at Wrigley, these fans are looking for any reason to get up, cheer, make some noise. So far, Arietta has not given them that opportunity. 95 is poured in there for strike one. You know, perception is not always reality, but the perception is you got to feel good when you're throwing out Lester, Arietta, and Hendricks. We saw the numbers on the last two pitchers for the Indians, six and one. Here's one into the gap in left center field. This ball is off the wall. And Kipnis will dig into second with a leadoff double. First hit of the night for the Indians. The first start for the Indians is to get on the scoreboard a great extension on a pitch away he splits the gap and then has to hustle like crazy because this ball comes right back to Fowler good throw and then the guy who can slap a tag on you faster than anybody <laughs> just not getting the ball in time to do that. Now the number three hitter Francisco Lindor who walked his first time. Chopper foul right side. T-Mobile One lets MLB fans always stay connected to the game they love with unlimited LTE data. Welcome to Unlimited Baseball. And welcome to a lit up Cleveland, Ohio. Josh Tomlin, the starter, ended up going two and a third tonight. Strike two. You know, Arietta's done a nice job just pitching above the zone. It hasn't always been on design to Lindor, but Lindor, who stays up the middle, as we've seen him get some hits early in this series, been a little frustrated with Arietta. Get some high curveball strike threes and high sinkers for strike threes. Pitch in the dirt. Good pitch by Arietta. Strikeout number six. And out number one here in the fourth. Well, this is a great breaking ball. That thing disappears. You know what's interesting, too? We also talked to potentially the game seven starters. And it's funny because in each dugout, they're hoping for opposite results. Been on both sides where I'm begging for a game seven as Hendricks might want to be. And then, you know what? I'm cool. We don't need a game seven. That's where Kluber's at. Here's Napoli. Ball one. But that score has made you think just the opposite. So Kluber, in his mind, will start preparing, I would think, about game seven with the score currently the way it is. And the same thing for Hendricks. They emotionally detach and start preparing for their game as if it's going to be played. And that's the proper thing to do. A check swing and that caught somebody on its way to the backstop after it hit the bat of Napoli. One ball, one strike. You know, in uh, 92, when I was fortunate enough to pitch three games in a seven game series against the Pirates, our game seven went terrible, blown out. And I went home early. I didn't want to watch it. Game six when I was getting ready to pitch game seven. The one one. That's too far inside for ball two. So my preparation was I know I'm going to pitch now. So I'm going to go home and prepare for it and, and mentally block out the amount of runs they were getting and the hits because you start staring at it. You start thinking you didn't. I just wanted to get away from it. But if your team rallied you would have missed the picture. It was like in the seventh or eighth inning. Okay. Here's a 2 1. Up and away, 3 and 1. 
And so mentally, you just go home, you get in your routine, you get ready for the game, and hope to pitch a gym. Three one pitch. Full count as Napoli was trying to drive one out of here. Napoli playing in his third World Series. He lost his first try with Texas, won in 2013 with Boston. Arietta trying to pitch around a leadoff double here in the fourth. That's in the left center field. We'll get down for a hit. It'll score Kipnis and put Cleveland on the board. It's 7 1. That's what they need. Grind them out one at a time. Maybe run into a two run homer. Good at bat there. 3 1 gets a 3 2. And Jake elevates it seat to Seamer. He gets just enough of it for an easy RBI. Batter now is Jose Ramirez. Struck out his first time. We'll get into the comments of both Hendricks and Kluber as we go through this game, but right now the Indians trying to feel better about this score. So they try to end this World Series tonight. Cubs want to play on. 1-0 pitch. 2-0. If necessary, tomorrow night on the air at 7 Eastern. Kyle Hendricks, who led the big leagues. In ERA this year against Corey Kluber, four and one this postseason, two and zero this World Series. One games one and four. Here's a 2-0. That's into right field. Hayward's got it. And a big second out here in the fourth inning, and that's exactly why Jason Hayward stays in the lineup. Good jump, good catch. Two down. Way harder than it looks. This ball sinking, but Hayward gets to it. Long stride, good defender, and protects from this ball getting by him because that ball gets by him. It's not only a run score, but a possible inside the park home run. The Cubs defense, which has been so good all year, in this series been a little less than sloppy. They've made some errors and uncharacteristic throws and plays that they haven't. But all will be forgotten if they tighten it up in the last two games. Chisholm Hall, strike one. Three-time Gold Glove Award winner is Jason Hayward. Wears a green rubber bracelet on his right wrist. There it is. In honor of Luke Karhoff, a young man he met while playing with the St. Louis Cardinals. That hits Chisenhall to put two on. And all of a sudden, with Coco Crisp coming up, the Cleveland Indians are sniffing a big fourth inning here. If Coco can figure something out, here comes Chris Bazio. This is just a quick mound visit, just to reset. That's all he needs. Reset the situation, say, no big deal. Let's just get the ball away. Don't make a mistake over to Crisp. He's turned on some pitches. So while they congregate, I'll tell you the UFC's legendary New York debut begins on FS1 with the biggest prelims card in UFC history. UFC 205 prelims live from Madison Square Garden, November 12th, only on FS1. Back to the dugout, Basio. Up to the plate, Coco Chris, who's been so good this season. This type spot two for two this postseason. 
with at least one in scoring position. He's got runners at first and second. That gets away from Contreras. And the runners advance. You see the sinker just gets underneath. And good movement by actually changeup. The first changeup we've seen out of Jake. That could go either way. Could very well be a pass ball. And it is. Runners at second and third. Two out. Here's a 1-0. Crisp opportunity. 3 0 with his team down six. Loads him up. It'll bring in Tyler Naquin, who was part of that misplay in right center back in the first inning. Rajay Davis is wearing a microphone. If we get an opportunity during this at bat, We'll dip into a conversation they had after that play in right center and then almost another one two innings later. I normally wouldn't say this after a walk with the bases loaded but Naquin has had struggles with the fastball. He's got to look over the middle of the plate for something early on to drive because you know Jake's going to attack him with fastballs. Naquin. Strike one. Naquin during the regular season hit 14 home runs. He's not gone deep in the postseason. We talked to Terry Francona. He said maybe Tyler can run into one tonight. If he does here, it's a two run game. Coming right after him, strike two. Yeah, and that's again, that's just been the book. And. That pitch split the, the middle part of the plate right there, but the good movement at the end. Elevate the fastball right here with two strikes. Bases loaded, two out. In case you're wondering, there have never been two grand slams in one World Series game. Addison Russell hit one for the Cubs in the third. Make one a chance here in the bottom of the fourth. Six into the fifth, game six. Back after this from your local Fox station.
Chicago in the fifth. Does he lead by six? How about that? Joining a list with Mickey Mantle, youngest player with home runs in back to back games of a World Series with his team facing elimination. Bryant went deep to get the scoring started in game five. And he went deep to get the scoring started in game six. This time it happened in the first. Salazar back to work. The ball and a strike on Chris Bryant. Part of that discussion, I think, also with Basio going out there was, look, if it doesn't go well, the count not in your favor with Crisp, know who's on deck, and you feel better, and obviously the fastball command, and we've seen two at-bats and two strikeouts. Hard hit left side. Lindor knocks it down, but no chance. And Bryant is heating up. What a good sign for the Cubs. Chris Bryant, who struggled through the first four games of this World Series is getting hot. How about tonight? Here are the three, four, five, six hitters for Joe Madden. Well, it's that first five that has done the damage that allowed Addison Russell to do exactly that, the grand slam. And when guys start heating up, I talked about the contagious effort it been for the Cubs. They all feel that mojo, and certainly in a desperate game, Getting those runs early took a lot of pressure off of them, put a lot of pressure on the Indians. Here's Rizzo, who has two solid singles into center field in this game. That gets away, and down to second is Bryant with nobody out. And we haven't seen a ton of offenses. Postseason because the pitching's been unbelievable. Also, the weather has had something to do with it. Well, an unusual 72 or plus degree night. As we see that pass ball. And another warm one tomorrow. It's got to have the hitters feeling a lot better than they did in previous games. They're going to give that one a wild pitch. So a runner at second with nobody out as the Cubs try to get that run back. They led seven to nothing after three and a half. Indians just got one and left the bases loaded in the bottom of the fourth. 1 0 pitch. A ball and a strike. Two. Talking about Chicago and earlier I mentioned the last team down three games to one to come back and win the World Series the 85 Royals over the Cardinals. Eleven teams have been down three games to one since that 85 World Series. And the Cubs are one of just five. To win game five none. Of those teams went on to win game six. Rizzo pops it up down the left field line. Long run. Yeah. By Ramirez. What a play by Jose in foul ground. One off. If you're at home, you have no idea how hard this play was. Running with his back towards you, playing a little bit on the shift, and, and going towards that tarp and the stands. Reaching back. Great play. Tremendous effort by Jose Ramirez and able to corral it for out number one. The batter will be Zobrist. Good sip to this fastball from Salazar tonight. 96 misses ball one. He has an, an electric arm. He really does. That's a quick, quick arm action. Good change up. Decent breaking ball, but I'll tell you what, the 96 jumps on the hitter. Won 11 games during the regular season, was 11 and 6. 
Good ERA of 3.87. And finally got himself back in shape after getting over that forearm strain for the World Series. And since coming back, and of course, he's not been in the rotation. A little rhythm problem and command issues with his fastball at times. That, that is nice. Can't teach that. That four seam backspin, you hear the pop of the glove. There's a one one. Hear the term live arm. That's exactly what it means. You play catch with guys, and some guys, the radar gun, they'll light up, but when you play catch with them, it doesn't seem like that late life. In other words, the best way to describe it is you think you're going to catch the ball, and the ball catches you. It's on you. That's what late life is. That's what Salazar has. Changeup looks like it's coming right here. Strikeout for out number two. And that's the third strikeout for Salazar. In an inning and two thirds. And in the third inning, the guy coming up, Addison Russell, gives us StatCast, powered by Amazon Web Services, the Grand Slam. How about a six RBI night for Addison Russell? Part of our game summary sponsored by Budweiser. And the second youngest player to hit a Grand Slam in a World Series game, Mickey Mantle, the youngest. So there's Mantle twice. You know, it's been kind of a shoots and ladder lineup from six on down, right? And Joe Madden said, I'm putting this guy back up because I'm going to show him, as you mentioned, confidence. I'm going to give confidence to him by putting him higher up, even though he's struggling, because he's a confident guy. And that's what he did in the regular season by putting him in the fifth spot. It's not the prototypical fifth hitter, 220 average, but he responded with 90 RBIs because the traffic on the bases he was able to deliver. The 0 1 pitch. Oh, lost the bat. Down we go to Ken Rosenthal. Addison Russell is only 22, but in this postseason he has shown uncommon maturity. Check out what happened in each of these past two series. NLCS 0 for 10, lowers his hands, goes 6 for 12 the rest of the way. World Series, one for 14, chasing pitches with a number of other young Cubs, five for seven, and here he is again, with the chance to do more damage. Yeah, an opportunity for a seven RBI night with a base hit here. Bryant was at second with nobody out. He's there with two out. And Ken, each time it's come after a hit where it, the confidence of going the other way has sparked him into being more disciplined and locked in in this stretch currently. Good swing there. Have you caught one in the booth? You've had to, right? All the uh, years of doing it. Yeah, not bad. maybe one or two. I usually duck. I'm, I'm really not trying to be a hero. Well, I've learned from my past experience, so you're in good hands. I, I made a mistake early in my broadcasting career. I won't make it again. And it was. It was a very bad spot that I got hit in. Oh. It was too eager, as we've seen a couple yeah. come up this way. So yeah. I'm just calm now. I'm ready. Now thinking to the count. Salazar trying to put away Russell. Which he does. Got him looking. Strikeout number four. Salazar gets out of trouble in the fifth. Halfway through game six. Cubs lead it. Seven to one.
podcast is sponsored by State Farm. Here to help life go right. Welcome you back to the World Series on Fox. Tonight's telecast is presented by T-Mobile One. Beautiful scene down below. Ballpark is alive and kicking. On the 1st of November 2016, game six, and the Cubs lead 7-1. to one. As the number nine hitter, Roberto Perez, looks at a strike from Jake Arrieta. 71 degrees at the start of the night. Inside a ball and a strike. And yeah, what a blessing because these two teams who are obviously trying to end a long drought, it won't be because of the weather that has any play in these last two games, which is going to be nice. Perez. Totally fooled on that breaking ball down and away. Missed it by a lot. One ball, two strikes. Arietta has struck out seven, walked only two, hit a batter. Got a big strikeout last inning with the bases loaded. That's down the chute. And goodbye to Roberto Perez. Strikeout number eight. People around the ballpark on this beautiful night. Mike Hargrove, Jim Tomey. Al Roker is here with the Cleveland hat on. There's Drew Carey. Great guy. Bill Murray, you know, he's in the house watching his beloved Cubs. Clearly, Pearl Jam is not on tour. Eddie Vetter back for more, and Chris Chelios, his seatmate. 19 points tonight, 13 boards. For LeBron James and an eight point win next door for the Cavs over the Rockets. It's amazing when you were part of a city and celebrating a championship like they did in the NBA. Everybody in every sport starts rooting. I mean, this is a natural thing for the Cavs to want to see the Indians do what the Cavs did. Every sport gets caught up in it. Look at that scene at Gateway Plaza. Here's a foul. Terry Francona wanted to come in and watch the parade for the Cleveland Cavaliers when they had it. And he was in the stadium here looking over at 1.3 million fans lining the streets of Cleveland to celebrate LeBron and the Cavs. What a scene that was. Will there be another parade the same year? Here's a pop up on the infield. Rizzo took his eye off the ball for a moment, has it two out. So they win it in June, coming back to beat Golden State. And look at that. That's unbelievable. Just great. And then on October 25th, raising of the banner, the rings. Which are uh, rather large. <laughs> and we had game one of this World Series, a win by the Indians, a celebration for the Cavs. Cavs won that night, too. Here's a pitch that bounces into Kipnis. Two out, nobody on. A 1 0 pitch. Jason doubled his last time, and he scored the only run tonight for Cleveland to count 2 0. You know, just again, when we were talking earlier about trying to find storylines and statistics, I saw somewhere somebody tweeted the last time the Indians were in a game seven situation and there were two ties in the NFL. They did. Well, yeah, exactly. Come on. How long do you got to search stuff like that? <laughs> By the way, there's two ties in the NFL. Yeah, there are. <laughs> Right hander Jeff Manship is getting loose. Three and one on Kipnis. See, this is the only thing that you, you run in with Arietta. Two quick outs, 3 0 count, 
he can go back and forth like this. It's not your prototypical locked in. As Basio's sitting here going, lock in, six run lead, pour some fastballs in there. Kipnis hits it deep in the left at the wall. Kipnis, goodbye, seven to two. fell behind in the count and paid the price. You know, we used to have back in the day a fine. If you got two outs and you went 3-0, there's the home run celebration. You got fined. But he got behind, had to come in, and Kipnis is glad that the 3-1 fastball went where it did. He's doubled. He's now homered, scored both runs. Here's Lindor. Strike one. The largest comeback wins in postseason history, just to get this out there. Eight by the Philadelphia A's over the Chicago Cubs. The 1929 World Series game four. Down eight nothing, one ten eight. Kipnis got a lot of power the other way. A one. Hard hit right at Rizzo on one hop. And that sends game six into the sixth. Solo shot Kipnis. Cubs lead is five. Fourth pitcher of the night for Terry Francona is Jeff Manship. And this is down and away ball one to Wilson Contreras. Bottom three in the lineup for Chicago Contreras, Hayward, and Baez. Seven to two after the Kipnis home run. You're going to see a lot of those, by the way. He loves that pitch. And he can spin it. Another one of those guys that can spin a baseball. I think we 
have set the unofficial record for the use of the word spin during a World Series. It's it's That's a new word that everybody uses now because they can measure how many times that baseball is spinning to home plate. But that's what you're seeing the Cubs do a lot. One away is Contreras is now 0 for 3 and we'll welcome you inside our broadcast booth. I'm Joe Buck. That's a Hall of Famer John Smoltz. There's a Hall of Famer out there watching Bill Webb who's recovering from a couple of broken ribs. We miss you Bill. I miss your awful singing. <laughs> I miss you coughing into my ear right here. We're thinking of you tonight buddy. As John Absolutely. Moore has done a fantastic job sitting in the seat. Normally manned by our good friend Bill Webb. Pete Macheska sitting there next to John Moore. Our producer is Pete. And with one out, here's a strike to Hayward. Manship. Hayward. Strike two. Steve Horn our editorial consultant reminded us during the break that the late great Jim Fregosi coined the phrase sometimes you have to learn how to lose in a series like this and tonight you mentioned it earlier Terry Francona can go through his bullpen he can bring in good arms but he can save his big weapons for a potential game seven this team doesn't rally and I'm talking about the left hander Andrew Miller the right hander Brian Shaw and the right hander Cody Allen that's that's a lot of thunder in that bullpen if there's a game seven and that's why I thought it would be the hardest game he'd manage if it was close imagine in this situation right here he would be awfully tempted in a tie game or a one run lead to do exactly that the formula has to work out for Terry Francona and his team to be successful and it has when they've taken the lead after five they don't lose period last twenty three. But in a game like tonight in a weird way if this plays out and it doesn't get close it actually is an advantage for him. I mean the worst kind of losses are the ones you lose late right. Well this one might have been lost early. Hayward gets under it skies it into right again. Chisholm Hall two up. A T-Mobile one in-game box score for the Cubs. A lot of hits right there in the middle from Bryant to Rizzo to Zilbrist and a six RBI night for Addison Russell. Outstanding collection of all the damage right there. And again unfortunately for the Indians this whole game's turned on a misplayed fly ball. Ball hit by Russell just a routine fly ball into right center in the first inning. This crowd as loud as it was Chisholm Hall and Naquin didn't communicate properly and the ball literally just fell with the two looking at each other and you see that doesn't happen as at home because the crowd is not as loud when a fly ball goes out that they know is going to be an out I remember at the Metrodome not not only was it hard to see because of the white ceiling but they were so loud and we had a misplay between our right fielder David Justice and Mark Lemke and it provided some runs for the Twins. Here's Baez sticking the bat out and getting a base hit. And that's a couple times now Javier Baez has gone up the middle and he looks skyward with his palms out to the side saying finally as he gets an infield hit. That's going to make his manager who had to sit down talk with him a lot happier. Look he looked bad on the first two and he decided to cut down his swing and take a chance with contact and that's exactly what happened. Here comes Terry Francona. Manship gives up the infield two out hit. Zach McAllister's coming in out of the bullpen in a five run game.
Well, Jeff Manship just exited. We talked about spin rates. StatCast is powered by Amazon Web Services. And here's the breaking ball and the spin rate. These pitches from Jeff Manship. And this is what's measured. That's, that's slowed down a lot. You won't see that kind of circle spin. The hitter at least won't see it like that. It's in RPMs is Fowler fly with one into left center. And there they are again. Naquin flashing in front of the left fielder Crisp. The inning is over. Bottom of the sixth inning rolls in in game six. Indians will bat down by five. First pitch from Jake Arietta misses to Mike Napoli for ball one. It's a Cavill Indians shirt. Here at Progressive Field, a 1 0 -oh pitch is swung on and fouled back. That might have gotten out of the park behind home plate. If not, it, to the back reaches of the upper deck. One ball, one strike on Napoli, who has an RBI single and a strikeout. Brad Mills, the bench coach. Another big swing by Napoli, strike two. You got to get the ball up, that's for sure. Down, he's got that swing path. He could hit moonshots. And the pitch down. So Brad Mills talking to Tyler Naquin. There's been a lack of communication out in right center and left center. They can't hear Naquin. Here's a 1 2 pitch. Just missed. 2 and 2. Joe West wouldn't ring him up. Glad you used the word just. Oh my. There's that late movement. A 
a swing and a miss on the very next delivery, and a strikeout starts the sixth. You know what's so impressive right there, Varietta? I mean, he doesn't show a ton of emotion anyways, but to just sit there and know, no big deal. All right, I know that was a strike. I'm not going to overreact. And make a quality pitch after the curveball, after he sees the fastball and makes a curveball pitch here. Joe Madden would love nothing more than to ride him at 125 pitches and give him seven, eight innings if the score stays like this. This is the time, though, where he has shown, Arietta has, to leak a little bit, and he has to get the bullpen up. But with a five-run lead and about 88 pitches, he would love to see at least get to the seventh or through the seventh. Jose Ramirez takes the ball. Jake Arietta went five and two-thirds in game two. One run on two hits, but three walks. Tonight he's walked two, struck out nine after getting Napoli a moment ago. That is high, 2-0. and oh. Yeah, the difference in that first game, besides the grip and the weather, is that he was throwing a no-hitter and would have been taken out because it wasn't the prototypical no-hitter where you locked in. He was all over the place a little bit. Tonight he has been much better. I mean, the pitches that he's missed have been close. And he got behind and gave up a three run a three one home run. But looks a lot better. Seven to two game Cubs on top two one pitch from Arietta. Jose Ramirez is fouled away strike two. And the reason I say that is because when the Cubs and the Indians if they were to play tomorrow and you can get through without using your big guns like it looks like. Cleveland might not. You want to have the same scenario for Chicago. That's ball three. Three and two. The big guy's out of the bullpen. He's one of them, Mike Montgomery, who's now rested and getting loose in case something starts for Cleveland. Obviously a role is Chapman and then if there is a game seven John Lester would be down there for Joe Madden. Three two. to be with the closers each game you don't use them in big games and big series just add an out meaning the next time they pitch however many times they did you add another out to each one of those outings that's where you get to two innings two and a third two and two thirds that's what I anticipate tomorrow if there is that fly ball in the left pretty well hit back is Zobrist two out T-Mobile one in game box score for Cleveland Kipnis has had a nice night. He's doubled. He scored twice. He homered last inning. Napoli with an RBI hit. Nothing else. A walk to Lindor. Jake Arrieta is one strikeout away from tying a Cubs franchise record for most strikeouts in a World Series game all time. He's got nine. The Cubs record is ten. And it was set in 1908. Orville overall 1908 game five against the Tigers. I wonder what his nickname was. Oh. <laughs> Strike one. You can't add a Y to any of that like most guys do when they have nicknames. O squared. I like O. One and two. Rather one ball, one strike. Chisholm Hall waiting. Two out. Ball two. Tom Bernucci. Yeah, Jake's fastball tonight, obviously on point. I'll start with a disclaimer. They did give him three runs before he took the mound. Now that's like Smoltzy giving me some strokes before we get to the first tee. It helps, but it doesn't guarantee anything. What we're seeing here, extreme velocity. He hit 97 early in this game. He's done that once the entire season and we talked a lot about the short rest for Josh Tomlin didn't talk much about the extra rest for Jake Arietta. look at the difference guys 
you're seeing a guy on November 1st throwing the baseball as hard as he has all year long. Your season in which he threw just under 200 innings in the regular season, 197 and a third. The count's full now with two out, nobody on on Chisholm Hall. Well, really, the last month and a half, the Cubs had the luxury to kind of go to a six man rotation. They were in cruise control. So their starters coming into this series, they were going to use four. Nobody comes back on short rest. Everybody they faced, it seemed like, had to come back on short rest after San Francisco series. They did it with the Dodgers. And then here against the Indians, another foul by Chisenhall. Obviously, Kershaw tried to do it. And now it's only three starters. If there is a game seven, it'll be Corey Kluber trying to do it for a second time within this series alone. Third time this postseason, 3 2 pitch. A two out walk. Third walk handed out by Arietta. And with Crisp coming up, Joe Madden will play with this no more. And just like he did in game two, Arietta goes five and two thirds. He leaves up by five with a man on, and Mike Montgomery will come into the game with Crisp, the scheduled hitter. Good work tonight for Arietta. Kicks off when bitter rivals USA and Mexico face off. Will it be Dos Acero again? Coverage begins Friday, November 11th at 7 Eastern on FS1. Or watch it live on Fox Sports Go. Tonight's aerial coverage as you look at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame brought to you by DirecTV. If you call yourself a sports fan, you got to get DirecTV. Call 1 800 DirecTV. Here's Brandon Geyer to take on Mike Montgomery, one on, two out. Yeah, interesting move here. The matchups favor Cleveland. That's why I thought he might leave in Jake. But one pitch. Russell flips for the out as Baez keeps his foot on the bag. And the fourth out ends the sixth.
This ball came up on Russell, smothered it, gathered, and flipped for the out. Seven to two after six, back after this from your local Fox station. Welcome back to the World Series on Fox. Tonight's telecast is presented by T-Mobile One. A look at Gateway Plaza where they are packed in watching, hoping for a big Cleveland rally as Schwarber leads it off and takes a ball from Zach McAllister. Brandon Geyer, who pinch hit, stays in the game and left. Schwarber 0 for 2 with a walk and a run scored. And has his first hit of the night. On to start the seventh inning with Bryant coming up. Guy can flat out hit. Schwarber gets his fourth hit in 11 at bats. He's also got three walks. Here's Chris Bryant. Bryant two for three tonight. Homered in the first. Single leading off the fifth. And then was stranded at second base when Rizzo, Zobrist, and Russell were taken care of by Salazar. Strike one. There's no reason to really hold him. Schwarber for Napoli. Bryant rarely goes that way anyways. There's a big gap between first and second. But typically if there was nobody on, the first baseman could help out in that area. I don't think Schwarber is going to be thinking about going anywhere. Station to station. Not after the knee surgery. Next one to Bryant. Outside for a ball. Really? 
really interesting to see how Joe Madden manages the last nine outs. Hoping, obviously, to get to a game seven tomorrow night. And he would love for Bryant or somebody else to pop one and give him a little more breathing room so he could take the load off of Roldis Chapman. He threw a career high out of the bullpen two and two thirds innings two nights ago in game five. I'm just telling you in this day and age with so much media attention and coverage and scrutiny you got to trust your guys but it's so hard when you have weapons people and even managers will get nervous even with a four run lead they're not going to take any chances if there's a four run lead or less Chapman's going to be in the game I can promise you even a five run game. Three one to Bryant Fouled back full and, count and I do it the other way. I would trust my guys and then bring them in only if I needed to uh, because of what's at stake not only obviously tonight but tomorrow and then you got a full complement of a guy that you can bring for two innings plus if you're going to do that down three games to one you're definitely doing that in the seventh, seventh game no doubt. Three two to Brian. That is a foul ball down the right field line. And Schwarber will have to come back to first. Sam Holbrook said foul ball. And it was. Bryant looking for a three hit night. And he should spin something right here. 3 2 count. <laughs> Popped up. Foul territory and out of room is the catcher, Roberto Perez. Well, he's throwing 97 98, but he's getting close to that nitro zone for Bryant. They're the guys on the postgame show on FS1, Kevin Burkhart, Alex Rodriguez, hit and hurt. Pete Rose and Frank Thomas. Clevenger up for the second time tonight. The left hander is Ryan Merritt. Game five star in the ALCS. Line drive, base hit, and a three hit night for Chris Bryant. First two are on for Chicago here in the seventh. Getting too good of swings and seeing all those fastballs. Now another mess for the Indians. Terry Francona, I don't know if he'll go to the left hander or not against Rizzo. Doesn't look like it at the moment, but I'll say again, these are big opportunities for Chicago. To end some of the suspense and potentially keep a role as Chapman in that bullpen until tomorrow night. Two on, nobody out, and the number four hitter Anthony Rizzo at the plate. Ball one. Fifth pitcher of the night for Francona McAllister after Manship, Salazar, Otero. Josh Tomlin, who pitched the Indians to the top of the division for good on June 4th. 2 0 this postseason tonight. Lasted less than three. Ball two, 2 0. Switch hitter on deck in Ben Zobrist. Dangerous count. Rizzo such a good hitter discipline to look at one spot and look in the lift be surprised if this ball was hittable on the ground <laughs> fouls it back behind the plate and out of play Rizzo homer twice during the NLCS once at Dodger Stadium once at Wrigley has not gone deep in this World Series two for three tonight. Seven for 20 against Cleveland. San Francisco did the best job against Rizzo. They just flat out didn't pitch to him. And it was frustrating. And that number you were talking about, one for 23, I think, at one point. Yeah. 
That's into right. Chisenhall will come to get it. The runners will hold at first and second one out. And Zobrist is walking to the plate. Junior Home Run Derby allows kids 14 and under to compete for the National Home Run Derby Championship at the 2017 All-Star Game. Sign up today to host a free competition in your local community at jrhrd.com. Here's Zilbrist, two for three. Singles in the first and the third, and now he flies one into left. Back is Geyer in front of the track, two out. And it will bring in Addison Russell. Zilbrist bat looks like it's the start of the season right now. It's fresh. Every ball he hits seems to be squared up and that one right there included. Addison Russell now in the month of October 17 games two in the regular season 15 in the postseason had six RBIs. In the month of November so far he's got six. This being November 1st game six ball one. Remember the lead runner is Schwarber does not run well. Bryant the trail runner at first two out now. McAllister trying to keep Cleveland in the ball game. Ninety seven past the bat of Russell strike one. Wow. First pitch slider and then fastball here you go try and hit it. He had a good swing on it. The 1 1. And now the 2 1. Hard hit, but right at Rivera. And the inning is over. Good job by McAllister to get around the back-to-back -back hits by Schwarber and Bryant. Time to stretch. Cubs lead, still five.
down in the sixth inning, and he's out there for the seventh. Rajay Davis first up, pinch hitting for Naquin. Ball one from the lefty, picked up in season from Seattle. Davis had a nice game five. A couple of hits, three stolen bases. One ball, one strike. You saw the numbers just three for 27 this postseason. He gets on, he can get things started for Cleveland down by five. Seventh inning of game six. Number nine hitter will be Roberto Perez. This week, start your Sunday with Fox NFL kickoff at America's number one pregame show. Then it's rookie sensation Dak Prescott and the Cowboys taking on the Browns. Or the Eagles collide with the Giants or other regional action coverage begins this Sunday at 11 Eastern on Fox. Lions just keep getting missed out. No, I, I see him on there, but I don't blame him. I really don't. Home the Cleveland Browns and get the Cowboys coming to town. Well, right now, Detroit 500 club, but they're in a division that seems more winnable by the week. Got the Cubs in the World Series, and last night for John Fox, a win for the Chicago Bears over the Minnesota Vikings, who now have lost two straight. One ball, one strike on Perez. Montgomery's curveball breaks so much. He's actually got to start it up higher than most, especially to the right handed hitter. It's something your brain doesn't always get around when you're thinking about throwing it for strikes. You're hoping that you swing, the hitter swings at him. Here's a 2 1. Three and one with a DH Santana on deck. Three one. Full count. As his fly to center struck out, starter Jake Arietta very strong tonight. Two runs, three hits, nine strikeouts, three walks. Then Montgomery, his 3 2, is down for ball four. A one out walk. Let's take another look. Hmm. Another pitch that looked pretty good called for a ball. And that's one on one out. Yeah, gutsy take there on the 3 2 pitch, but he got the benefit of it. Our oldest Chapman is up. Seventh inning. Justin Grimm is alongside. Strike one. Santana tonight 0 for 3. He's got nine hits this postseason. Three of them have left the park. He's been much better against left handed pitching. 4 17 at the start of the night. Strike two. But that is the pitch that gives him trouble. You've seen two good breaking balls after walking Perez. Index finger up, tremendous spin and downward tilt. He 
the 0 2. Outside, ball one. Are you surprised to see Aroldis Chapman getting loose for the Cubs in their bullpen here in the seventh I, of a five run game? I am. I mean, I understand it in theory, but I am because that's what I was saying about it. now the advantage. Here's a fly ball into center. Fowler has out number two. That's why you have an advantage being up three games to two and two games to play one for the Cleveland Indians because Joe Madden can't really take chances and assume in theory that you're just going to get to game seven. He has to be prepared to stop any kind of scenario. But man it it really does change the environment if if Chapman has to pitch multiple innings in a game like I know it's the last two games of the year and you got all off season to rest but you're human you're going to be a little fatigued even with the adrenaline rush of a World Series game seven well, you saw the bullpen phone ring I wonder if they told Chapman to stop after that second out of the inning you just don't want to get him too hot well the answer is no he's still going and he's throwing like he's coming in this game. One on two out. And, and counts two and oh now on Kipnis who's had a nice night with a homer and a double and the surprise for me if you go back to the San Francisco excuse me the L.A. situation when they got him up it was a relatively close game the Cubs blew it open and they brought him in and he gave up some runs and just looked disinterested in game five that's what you want to avoid here. Two zero, right side of base hit. Two on with two out. Kipnis a three hit night. And here comes Joe Madden. Could he be going to Chapman here in the seventh? You've got Lindor coming up, and he is up by five. Two out in the seventh. Here comes the big left-hander. In a seven to two game.
Aroldis Chapman, one of the major reasons why this World Series got back to Cleveland. 23 of his 42 pitches, which was two off his career high, were 100 or more. But after asking Chapman for eight outs two nights ago, is Joe Madden in a five run game asking him for seven outs tonight? I don't know, but when can you say this? The Indians are thrilled he's in the game. Think about it. Because regardless of what happens in this game, they will have typically burned up Chapman for multiple innings, it looks like, if there's a game seven. Lindor, strike one. So, yes, Joe Madden is going. I thought, you know, taking out Arietta early has propelled this to be this scenario because when you take out Arietta that early, you then force your bullpen to eat up the rest of the innings, and then you're almost forced to go to a scenario similar to this because you want to get to game seven. Here's the 0 1. Ground ball right side. Chapman, a race to the bag, safe. And the bases are loaded. And Chapman is limping just a little bit, going back toward the mound. It's about the second time he's done this with a lower leg, you'd think a knee. He was limping earlier as he completed the game earlier. And this one will be. Oh. Replay. They may look at that. Meanwhile, right now there's he's already got the ball so the question is does the right foot of Chapman hit the bag before Lindor and it looks like it does this would be a major reversal yeah, there's enough I think there to turn it and that's where I think he jams his knee a little bit now the trainer athletic trainer is going to come out and there it is but this just had a weird feeling about it from the moment Joe Madden went out there to make this pitching change and you know this is why it was so important in the top of this inning when the Cubs had two on with nobody out that they add on and they didn't good work by McAllister and now an out call at first so the inning is over and Chapman had to throw just a couple of pitches the question is is he injured? Let's go to the eighth.
seven of this World Series, the Cleveland Indians, the Chicago Cubs. Tomorrow night in a matchup of Kyle Hendricks and Corey Kluber. Pre-game show is at a special time on Fox, 7 Eastern, leading into game seven at eight, if necessary, or watch it all live on Fox Sports Go. Here's Clevenger into the game. And while Terry Francona hasn't had to use any of his big guns out of the bullpen, Miller, Shaw, or Allen, Joe Madden has already brought in a role as Chapman. The good news for Chicago is nobody's looking at Chapman on the dugout bench. He doesn't need any attention after it looked like he jammed his knee covering the bag on that ground ball to first by Lindor. And he threw only two pitches. Not to call it a panic move, but it has an odd feel with the Cubs needing to win two to win it all, knowing that tomorrow night they're going to have to go to their bullpen at some point with a lead. Joe Madden went for the throat here in the seventh inning. Now we're in the eighth, asking for seven outs from a guy who gave him eight outs and 42 pitches two nights ago. Yeah, you typically would go to this move if you needed just this game to win. I mean, no doubt. But I, again, I get the theory in general. There's no tomorrow if we don't win tonight. But if you don't hold a five-run lead with the balance of your bullpen and bring him in later, oh well. I, I mean, I, I he's hoping he's asked the question tomorrow. That means he won. Here's a 2 2 as Davis takes over in center. That's outside for a ball. Again, the Cubs had a runner at second. Nobody out in the fifth inning didn't score. Had two on with nobody out in the top of the seventh inning. And didn't add to a five run lead. That played a role in bringing Chapman in in the seventh inning as well. That's ball four. And, and I think, like you mentioned, I think the two out walk. By Arietta has made all these moves even possible. The two out walk, for whatever reason, in the history of what Arietta has been the last three weeks, they did not want to create any more opportunities. But then the left hander coming in allowed Francona to take Crisp and Naquin out and put in two right handers. So that's where we have the scenario right now. Cubs up five, and it looks like Chapman, unless they score a bunch more, is going to pitch at least the next inning. Here's Hayward now. And what's become evident in this World Series, the balance in the starting pitching goes to Chicago and their depth. The bullpen, no comparison. And the three big arms that Terry Francona has, and a couple of guys that Joe Madden trusts. Obviously, the lights out a role as Chapman. Madden trusts Mike Montgomery and everybody else you just don't know. And all have been good for long stretches this season. That's up and away 2 and 0. Ken Rosenthal is with us. So get your opinion. Were you surprised to see Chapman come in in the bottom of the seven very surprised and let's face it despite the situation at the time the chances of the Cubs winning were still excellent now my question now is how long will he go will he indeed finish this game or will they look to someone else to close it out to preserve him more for tomorrow here's a double play ball off the back of Hayward out at second got them both And with two out, nobody on, the batter will be Baez. Tom Berducci, what did you think of that move? Well, certainly surprised, but think about this, guys. If we get to a game seven, Joe Madden can cover nine innings with Kyle Hendricks, John Lester, and John Lackey, three of his four top starting pitchers. And I think even if Chapman closes this game, available for probably maybe one or two outs tomorrow. Uh, I think he's going to be available for more, but I, I don't think you bring him in this game if you don't anticipate him finishing it. So he's in it for the foreseeable future of this game. So two innings and a third, 
He can limit the pitches and get quick outs. But again, if you're the Indians and you're not going to win, to have him pitch two innings and a third, you got to feel great going into game seven with your ace on the mound and your ace in the hole, three guys that could come in as early as the fourth or fifth inning. This really, in my mind, shortens up the game and the window for the Cubs to get the lead tomorrow more than ever because we've seen what Terry Francona has done with his weapons so I believe it's Chapman's to finish and it's advantage Cleveland if there's a game seven that strength three and the inning is over Clevenger gets around the leadoff walk bottom of the eighth inning rolls in Napoli Ramirez Chisenhall coming up for Chapman and the Cubs who lead by five. Pitch misses up and away. Ball one to Mike Napoli. Napoli then Ramirez then Chisenhall against a rolled as Chapman who's still a bit gimpy. Limped out to the mound a bit. Fires a strike. Nice to be gimpy and throw 100 miles an hour. A count one ball one strike. And Napoli who's one for three. Four pitches thrown for Chapman. Cubs are hopeful he can be economical with the pitch count here in game six. Sizzling in for strike two. Well, what he did in game five was pretty remarkable since he doesn't do that a lot. Gotta believe his stock went up because he's a free agent, so every time he's able to pitch multiple innings. Napoli went around, and that's a strikeout to start the eighth. And it is, I think, exactly like looking at a stock. It's rising and falling throughout 
October. There are a couple of times where Chapman stock may have taken a hit. But it was when he came into games with men on an unclean inning so to speak. Because when he's been on and he's had the bases clear behind him. He's looked unhittable. Here's Jose Ramirez 0 for 3 tonight strike one. It was an eight out save for Chapman in game five. Not a save opportunity tonight. Up by five. Looking for seven outs potentially one ball one strike. for ball two two and one that's in the center for a big hit one on one out and Jan Gomes will come off the bench and bat for Chisholm This is what you need him to do, and this is what the Indians are getting a chance to do is see more and more of Chapman. Just to give you a little historical perspective, if Chapman were to finish this game tonight, the last pitcher to have two seven plus out game finishing outings in a single World Series, Bruce Souter for the St. Louis Cardinals in 1982. Master of the split finger pitch. Gomes strike one. Game two, he went two and a third, got the win. Game three, went two and a third, got the save against Milwaukee. Gomes is 0 for 2 this postseason, both at bats coming in this World Series. One ball, one strike. Now for Chapman, the more strikes he throws, the better, because you really ideally would like to get out of this game with 30 pitches or less. That means two innings and a third, and much more doable for multiple action tomorrow night. If he hits the 40 pitch mark, you're asking a lot. He'll pitch tomorrow if there's a game seven no matter how many pitches he throws that I'm sure of but the effectiveness is what goes in question how sharp how late life fastball we have versus generated lower leg velocity there's a big difference two balls and a strike now on Gomes. Two and two. I never claim even close to have the body that <laughs> Mr. Chapman has, so I can only speak from my experience of pitching three innings in an elimination game in the playoffs, not the World Series as a closer. And I just know I was going to fake it, that I wasn't tired after that game going back to game five. It just takes its toll. And you have the adrenaline and the rush, and you prepare and you flush your body the next day. But to think it doesn't have a toll on you is somebody who's never done it before. Broken back might be two. Out of second. Him. What a job by Baez. Unbelievable turn by Javier Baez as he took an errant toss. Stepped on the bag and fires across for the double play. And that takes a load off of Roldis Chapman. Circle that. Baez with the good glove work again. A magician at second base. Ninth inning now. Game six. Cubs by five.
jumped out to a seven to nothing lead for Jake Arietta. They lead seven to two ninth inning of game six. For Chicago it will be Dexter Fowler first up took a strike from Clevenger. And now a ball. Michael Martinez is in the game in right field. The bench is empty for Terry Francona. But his bullpen is well stocked with Shaw Allen and Miller Ryan Merritt also down there but Francona more than happy to have those three untouched ready for potential game seven A one two to the right side for Kipnis Fowler a hitless night. Boy it's been fun John to watch Javier Baez do what he's done all postseason around second base. Yeah, you see Russell got it in the palm and just kind of flicked it with his fingers. That is a huge play because as you mentioned that just reset the pitch count for Chapman that double play. You've seen it from the first base cam I'm assuming right there. I go back to the, the, the first inning and how it changed all the strategy for Terry Francona. One nothing going into the third. And Tomlin gets in trouble. He's using different formula of his bullpen. He can keep the game at a different point. Of course, once the bases were loaded and he brought in a reliever and the grand slam took it to this point. Here's a high fly ball into center. Back on the track. Davis two out. So this would have ended the inning. You're talking the first two out, a homer by Bryant. This is an easy fly ball that a miscommunication caused two runs to score a huge momentum swing three nothing for the Cubs Arietta before he even steps on the mound has been given a three run cushion and then it snowballs from there and it was Addison Russell who hit that ball into right center who in the third inning hit a grand slam his third home run of this postseason he's got 12 RBIs now for Chicago six of them here tonight in game six here's Bryant who's three for four Bryant has had good swings all night it even changes the way Tomlin would pitch to certain hitters because now you're behind the eight ball you got to try to pitch perfect so that game turned quickly for the Indians in a way that it changed strategy for Francona another hit for Bryant he's got a four hit game six. That's big momentum for their number three hitter again heading into a potential game seven Bryant three Rizzo four they haven't hit in these spots since July 3rd here's Rizzo best move that Madden made today was putting Schwarber in the second spot period it has affected the lineup it affects a pitcher and the way that you face a lineup. Strike one to Rizzo. And the hitters are feeding off. I mean, we talked about the five, the top five. Well, they have done their part with the exception of Fowler. The sixth spot delivered six RBIs because the front four in front of them gave Russell the opportunity to do damage. And he did it. Rizzo into right field. This ball is out of here. Nine to two. The lead is back to seven here in the ninth inning. And we'll see if that changes the strategy in the bottom of this frame. Nine to Chicago. And a big night by the three four hitters for Joe Madden. up for Chicago in their bullpen. But a conversation between Matt and Bazio. That's inside for a ball to Zobrist. 
I understand what Tom Verducci talked about. And it's a great point with regard to tomorrow night. Lackey's available. Lester's available. You're talking about having two vets do something they're not used to doing. And Lester is a guy who, as we've talked about and seen, has a impossible time keeping runners close. So, yeah, it's John Lester with his stuff, but in a tight game, how much do you trust him going in if you can't hold runners close to the base? Yeah, you're totally right. And the only way he comes in is starts the inning. And the only way he starts the inning is if they got a two or three run lead. In my opinion, based on what you just said, Lackey, Lackey could give you some length if you need it late or extra innings. But the beauty of this game, it's not easy managing. And it looks like the Cubs are going to fight to face a game seven and worry about all of that as it comes about. Well, now Basio's on the phone. We'll see who springs to action. But I think where you were going earlier is this. Zobris takes a walk. If you don't trust the guys in the bullpen enough to get three outs before the other side gets seven, then you don't have a chance anyway. Correct. Home run for Rizzo to make it a seven run game again. His first to the World Series. Here's Addison Russell. Russell with a six RBI night batting for the fifth time. A two run double and a grand slam. Two out in the inning. Zobrist aboard. Two and zero oh from Clevenger. I think the other scenario that could happen is we look at these guys that we talked about in the open. My goodness. The other thing that can happen with two outs and this happening with a two run homer as the bullpen gets going you have Chapman go out there and get an out. Give the guys time plenty of time and let them finish. Should end the inning. This is the 59th World Series game in Cubs franchise history. It's their first three homer game. Strope and Wood getting loose. Will one of them come in or will it be Chapman? Rizzo goes deep. Shows off the smile. Cubs up seven.
Fox. Tonight's telecast is presented by T-Mobile One. There'll be a lot to talk about after this one, especially with an eye toward tomorrow. Roldis Chapman has thrown 57 pitches now, 34 of which triple digits over the last three nights. Strope and Wood. But it's Chapman on the mound. Geyer at the plate. Ball one outside. We intend to talk to Joe Madden in our postgame show, which will air on FS1 with Kevin Burkhart, Alex Rodriguez, Frank Thomas, and Pete Rose. Two and zero, the count on Geyer. Rajay Davis on deck. Cubs jumped out with three in the first, four in the third, have led throughout. Down by seven, swinging on a 2-0 pitch. It's two and one. Explain that. How to give him the take for sure. But down seven, I guess I throw all those rules out. Down two. 100% take. But at some point, don't you want to I, maybe silly and splitting hairs, but make Chapman just keep throwing pitches? Yeah. Here comes a 2 1 pitch. 3 1. See if that's it. Yep. That's going to be it for Chapman, but it was not a short night. Here's the double play turned by Russell. Brilliance by Baez. That was in the bottom of the eighth. And then the home run by Anthony Rizzo. A two run shot into the seats and right. Rizzo and Bryant have had big nights. Chapman will think about a game seven as he's out here in the ninth inning of game six.
World Series Game 7. Tomorrow night, coverage begins at 7 Eastern. In a matchup of Kyle Hendricks and Corey Kluber. Special time on Fox, 7 Eastern. That's when we hit the air. Game time is 8 o'clock straight up. Or watch it all live on Fox Sports Go. Pedro Strope delivers a strike. Here's a jam shot foul back and out of play. Meanwhile, there have been records all over the place. World Series history made again as Bryant and Rizzo are the first three, four batters in World Series history to collect seven or more hits in a World Series game. And there are the numbers, 62 pitches for Aroldis Chapman over the last two games, albeit with a day off in between. He threw 20 here tonight in an inning and a third. Allowed one hit, walked one, struck out one. High fly ball in the air to left, back into the corner. It's Zobrist for a long first out in the ninth. Davis gave it a ride, but Zobris tracked it down, one on, one out. I know there's been major comebacks before, and we've seen it in the regular season, but it's unreal how intensified this game and this time of the year, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing when you start counting outs, counting runs, counting base runners. If this happens, if that happens, Whew. I'm glad we're up here. <laughs> one on, one out. Here's a wild pitch by Stroke. As Roberto Perez looks at ball one. I thought the theme tonight was going to be at least, I didn't say it in the beginning, but I thought there'd be 11 pitchers tonight. And there's been 10. It just has a feeling with the way that this game's being played with Tomlin and Arietta. Now I never thought it would be nine to two, but nonetheless, ten pitchers. Four for the Cubs, six for the Indians. But none for Cleveland that would be considered their top three in the bullpen. And that is their closer, Cody Allen, their setup reliever, right hander Brian Shaw, and Mr. Almost Perfect Andrew Miller. They are all ready for game seven. Exactly. 62 pitches for Aroldis Chapman over two games. Strike two on Perez. Put your seatbelts on and enjoy tomorrow night. Yo Matt changing his lineup tonight. Paid off immediately with Schwarber in the number two spot. Moving Bryant back one, Rizzo back one, Zobris back one. And then Russell out of the number six spot with six RBIs. For the most part, all Cubs tonight. Here's one into right. This ball will go into the corner. That'll score the runner as Geyer comes home. Throw to second and out. For the second out on a throw by Hayward and a tag by Russell. Down by six. Terry Francona loses a runner on the bases. And that won't sit well with Terry. That won't, but you're not going to see a better throw right here. Jason Hayward gets to this ball and then just throws a bullet so far that he had to jump did Russell and so much that he was out easily with Perez trying to get to second and the tag by Russell on the right foot of Roberto Perez now two out here's Santana he takes a ball Game sevens in a baseball postseason series are usually things of beauty. 
You get a tight game seven, and in my opinion, there's nothing in sports like it. It's they, the best. They don't come along that often, but when you get a good game seven, you just can't step away from the pressure all night. What a good matchup. Here's a four pitch walk to Santana. The batter will be Kipnis. <laughs> Joe West is not happy about the mound visit. He wants to move it along. Well, he won't be happy about this either. We got to 11. I don't know if Strope was upset about the balls and strikes or whatever, but Contreras came out. So did Matt. Now Strope's coming out, and a smile from Pedro to Joe West. On top with three in the first, and they've been smiling ever since. Leaving Wrigley, going on the road and forcing a game seven with one more out. We're in the bottom of the ninth inning, a nine to three game, two out. And after the next out, it will be official. World Series game seven, the starters, Kyle Hendricks against Corey Kluber pitching on short rest for the third time this postseason second time in this World Series two great ERA's and then the fun after they start tomorrow night's game seven here's Travis Wood into the game Jason Kipnis has had a big night strike one taking second is Santana uncontested and no stolen base awarded. Kipnis, three for four, needing a triple to hit for the cycle. There's never been a cycle achieved by a hitter in postseason play. You better not pull it. Hayward's over there. 1,508 games. There hasn't been a cycle, and there won't be one here tonight. This is Russell. Cubs have forced a game seven. Winning it nine to three. And a big night for the heart of this Chicago lineup. Bryant and Rizzo. Zelbrist and Russell. And Travis Wood gets the final out in a three-hour, 29-minute game.
The winner is Arietta, the loser, Josh Tomlin. And tomorrow will be the 38th winner take all game seven in World Series history. And the third in the last six years. 2011, the Cardinals and the Rangers. Two years ago, the Giants and the Royals. Well, I don't know how much sleeping there will be tonight, but I can tell you this whoever enjoys the moment the most tomorrow will have a better chance of success. You have two of the most non emotional pitchers that I think are ready for a game seven in Hendrick and Kluber. Kyle Hendricks, one and one after a 16 and eight year. And here's the final out and a subdued reaction from Joe Madden. The DH, who is back in business with a series in Cleveland. And Addison Russell, who on the 1st of November has a six RBI game six. And then back in Chicago, where they're having fun at Murphy's Bleachers. The celebration has been going since just after 8 o'clock when the Cubs got three in the first. Let's go down to the field and check in with Tom Verducci. Thanks, Joe. I'm with Joe Madden. Joe, you confounded armchair managers all over the country, bringing your closer into the game with a lead in the seventh inning. Of, and then in the ninth inning, having him go out there with a lead of seven runs. Please explain how you used Aroldis Chapman well, tonight. I was trying to get Stropey ready. That happened so quickly with the home run. We had to get him ready. I wanted to get him out there, but that's why he went out for one hitter only. He's good. Uh, hitter uh, out or drawing the walk. He's still out of the game. Uh, brought him in earlier because that's the part of the order he had to get out. He did not want the game to get away from you at that particular moment, so it all worked out well. Now he has thrown 62 pitches in the last three days. What do you anticipate in terms of tomorrow, length and effectiveness of Aroldis Chapman? I, I really anticipate a lot of the same. I do. He's a very strong young man, and uh, again, I'll talk to him later today and tomorrow, but I think he's going to be fine, honestly. Thanks, Joe. We'll see you in game seven. My pleasure, buddy. Thank you. And with me also, Chris Bryant. Chris, you got this game off to a start for the Cubs at the home run in the first inning. The curveball from Josh Tomlin. Tell me about the approach on that swing. Uh, I mean, he threw me one the previous pitch. Um, it was away. I mean, you can't really do much with the curveball away. That's kind of how it's been going the series. But, uh, you know, I saw it really good coming inside. And, you know, I love hitting curveballs. Five hits in your last seven at bats, two of those home runs. How do you feel about the way you're swinging it right now? I feel good. I mean, it, it's happening at the right time. Um, you know, I love this team when our back's against the ball, and we saw it, you know, two days ago, and you saw it tonight. Um, it was just really good baseball. You get to do it again tomorrow, backs against the wall for a game seven. How does that sound? We dream for that, man. I mean, I, we, we know it's going to be a good game. You know, we know their guy's going to be good. Um, we got one of our best pitchers this year, too, going. So um, you dream for this, man. Thanks, Chris. We'll see you tomorrow. Now over to Ken Rosenthal. Thanks, Tom. Addison, let's start off with a little historical fact. You became the second youngest player tonight to hit a grand slam in a World Series game after Mickey Mantle. What's your reaction to that? Uh, surprised, you know, rounding the bases. Uh, a lot of emotion was going through my head. Uh, just happy it came tonight. Now, you struggled in the NLCS, came out of it. You struggled at the start of the World Series, came out of it. How were you able to do that both times? Uh, it's just no panic, you know. This is our lifestyle. We're here to have some fun. We're here to win some ball games. We're here to pick some teammates up, and uh, that's just our that's just our game. That's how our bit. That's how we played all year. So uh, it's a lot of fun. Game seven tomorrow. It's what every kid dreams about. How excited will you be tonight? Will it be difficult to sleep? Uh, I hope it's not difficult to sleep, but yeah, it's every kid's dream. I mean, it all comes down to game seven, and uh, we're excited. We're just gonna go out here and just treat it almost like another game. Addison, thanks very much. No Joe, back to you. Kenny, thank you, and thanks to Tom Berducci. Nice of Joe Madden to grant the interview after this game six and explain his thinking with regard to Aroldis Chapman, who comes on for an inning and a third and allows one run on one hit. Through 20 pitches, and tomorrow, the two longest World Series droughts, one of these will come to an end. The Cubs have been waiting since 1908. Will it end tomorrow night or will it end for Cleveland? They last won it all in 1948. The pitching matchup, Kyle Hendricks, the right-hander. 
after a 16 win season led the big leagues in ERA against Corey Kluber. He's been a warrior this postseason four and one after an 18 win year. And when we play tomorrow by days it will be thirty nine thousand four hundred sixty six days since the Cubs last won it all for the Indians twenty four thousand eight hundred fifty nine extra innings tomorrow. That's your call yeah. from John Smoltz. There's nothing like a game seven winner take all for the 38th time in World Series history. Can't wait. Kevin guys. It's all you OK Joe and John thanks very much it will be a game seven and we are fired up to talk about this game six. We will do that coming up here on Fox the Cubs win they force it plenty to do we'll have a reaction from the field from the clubhouse. We've got a lot to talk about in this game Cubs offense come alive and are all this time and use in an interesting situation. We'll be back to do that but it was these Cubbies the offense came to life early and often tonight to force a game seven in this exciting World Series and so the Cub fans out in full force here in Cleveland game seven here we come post game we're back.